Okay, uh, welcome everyone. This is the third session of the Styles in the Arts and in the Sciences seminar. Uh, the seminar is part of AP Style, a project which, have, which has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under the Marie Curie Grant Agreement number 1010-3646. I invite you to visit uh, the website of the project, uh, univet.it slash epistyle, uh, for more information about the project itself, but also uh, for the complete program of the seminar with the uh, abstracts of the forthcoming talks. Um, Mind you once again that this meeting will be recorded. So if you, uh, um, by participating, you give your consent. If you don't wish uh, your image to be recorded, please feel free to turn your camera off. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Andrea Pinotti. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for, for having accepted my, my, my invitation. Andrea Pinotti is full professor of aesthetics at the Department of Philosophy uh, of the University of Milan. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Milan. His main research interests include aesthetics, art theory, art history, the morphological tradition, uh, image theories and visual culture studies, memory studies, and empathy theories. Uh, Andrea currently runs um, a near sea project on uh, um, an icon. Uh, and uh, iconology, history, theory, and practices of environmental images at the University of Milan. He has published several, several contributions of, on style, very insightful, very um, instructive uh, publications on style, only to mention to mention Chu, uh, the early Il Corpo dello Stile, Storia dell'arte come storia dell'estetica a partire da Zemper, uh, Riegel, uh, and Wolflin. Uh, and uh, the more recent Stile Moderno, Saggi di Estetica Sociale, edited with Barbara Carnevali and came out with Einaudi 2020. To today, sorry, um, uh, today he presents a talk titled Style in Art and Style in Perception, a Problematic Correlation. So um, without further ado, please, Andrea, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Matteo, for this invitation. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you all for being here with me to discuss an issue about style. I have to confess that <clears throat> the more I explore the notion of style, the less I understand it. So I will be glad to hear from you about your, your feedbacks. Um, in particular, <clears throat> when Matteo invited me, I chose to focus on a problematic correlation, as my title reads, um, between styles in art and styles in uh, perception. This is something which fascinates me, but also troubles me from a problematic, uh, from a theoretical point of view. So. Uh, this is this is a reason why your your comments and and critics will be very very helpful and useful to me. My starting point is of course uh, Walter Benjamin, who put forward an, a hypothesis about possible correlation between uh, styles uh, in. Uh, art and styles in perception. For example, in this review of uh, a book by Dolph Sternberger uh, about the panoramas in 19th century, he writes the question, I quote, of whether people's visual impressions are determined only by natural constants, natürlichen Konstanten, or additionally by historical variables, historischen Variablen is at the very leading edge of research. To move an inch, we will see if we will be able to move this inch today, <coughs> to move an inch closer to an answer, to an answer, sorry, is a hard one advance. This was Benjamin, uh, um, he died in 1940, as you know, so these were issues 
which uh, attracted his attention uh, in the second half of the 30s and most notably in a paragraph of the famous work of art uh, in the age of its uh, technological uh, reproducibility where Benjamin um, puts forward and elaborates a bit more this idea just as the entire mode of existence of human collectives changes over long historical periods so too does their mode of perception the way in which human perception is organized the medium in which it occurs is conditioned not only by nature naturlich but by history geschichtlich the era of the migration of peoples an era which saw the rise of the late roman art industry and the vienna genesis or genesis developed not only an art different from that of antiquity but also a different perception so and here we have the clearest uh, presentation Benjamin did not have the time because of, of his tragic and premature death. Um, he did not have the time to further develop this idea. So he kind of threw these hypotheses, uh, but uh, he left it there for us to, to, to develop. Um, the reference to late Roman art industry, uh, the reference to the Vienna Genesis, which is a manuscript, um, illuminated manuscript uh, of the book of Genesis uh, going back to the 6th century, refers implicitly, it's a kind of crypto quotation of the Vienna School of Art History, the Wiener Schule and in particular late roman art industry refers to uh, art historian alois regal we know that um, benjamin was a fond reader even already when he was uh, a young boy of uh, a book published by regal on late roman art industry 1901 it is a revolutionary book under many respects <clears throat> I, I cannot focus on the various reasons why this book is very important and revolutionary for the methodology of art history. I will just focus on um, part, on a point which is crucial to this argument. Um, we could say that Regal in this book develops uh, an aesthesiological approach to artistic styles. I say uh, aesthesiological uh, and not just uh, aesthetic to stress the etymological root of aesthesis. The fact that styles must be described according to Regal <laughs> because they are able to engage our bodily experience. They they make us do things. They invite us to approach through a near vision images in some cases. Or they push us away and they oblige us to adopt the right distance in front of an image. So typically focusing on uh, ancient art, Regal speaks of a first phase in the ancient uh, wheel of art, Kunstwollen, which is a very difficult term to translate into English and into Italian as well. Speaking of this art as tactile, tactile meaning that the contours, the silhouette of the, of the figures of the characters depicted in uh, Egyp ancient Egyptian visual culture, is always clear you can so to say <clears throat> transform your eye into a finger tip and follow the contour of the figure and there's it's never ambiguous you always know where a figure ends and when the background starts there's no 
optical confusion. <clears throat> Later on, Riegel uh, would prefer the term haptish rather than tactish. Haptish coming from the Greek verb hapto, meaning I touch. So the, the, the tactile, but in the sense of a tactility, which is a variation, a variant uh, of a mode of seeing. Seeing in a close approach, a near image, an image which invites me to explore it from a close, the closest distance possible. On the contrary, if we move on to a further phase in antiquity, namely <coughs> late Roman art, things change a lot in terms of perception. The tactile um, configuration of the contours leaves the floor to an interplay of uh, chromatism, of chiaroscuros, of light and shadows, so that it's very difficult to appreciate the limits of the single figures. And you need to go at, a, at the right distance to distantiate yourself, to put yourself as, as, a, as an observer, as a beholder, at the right distance in order to appreciate this, this interplay of, of uh, shadows, of, uh, of spots of color, of dynamics in chromatism. Fernsicht, meaning it's a view at a distance. And uh, it's interesting that Riegel and other colleagues uh, like Vikov characterized this phase of the late Roman artist industry in an anachronistic way as impressionistic. So if you think of, uh, for example, a pointillist painting, if you go too close to the painting, you see nothing. You cannot appreciate the distinction of the figures. You just see little spots of uh, colors uh, in a um, <clears throat> general confusion in chromatism. So you need to take a step um, and uh, to distantiate yourself from the picture so that you can see a woman appearing, a boat appearing, a uh, plant appearing, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> the pyramid and the pantheon, respectively, the typical, uh, the ideal typical architecture of Egyptian art uh, and the ideal typical building of late Roman art, represent for Regal two extremes, as he as he says. Hmm? While the pyramid was based on the Nazihtich, on the close vision, the Pantheon has to adopt the distant vision. And there is a movement so that you go from the tactile vision to the optical vision. You trust your eyes, so to say. You learn to trust your eyes. So here, it's a kind of parallelism, a parallel as it is in ontology, in, uh, in, um, in the uh, evolutionary development of the, of the child. The child, when uh, the child is very young, newborn, he or she wants to touch everything, to assure himself or herself of the concrete existence of, of the objects around the body. But <clears throat> growing, the child learns to trust his or her eyes to have things at a distance. We also know that uh, Benjamin, when he was a, a student at the university in 1915, he had been pupil of Heinrich Wölflin, the famous art historian, Swiss art historians in Munich. And uh, in the very same year, 1915, Wölflin um, develops um, a theory of styles 
which has many analogies, which shows many analogies with the uh, theory developed by Regal. In spite of the fact that Werfling refers to completely different periods, because uh, if Regal was interested in the movement from ancient Egypt to late Roman art, uh, we all know that Werfling was obsessed with the passage from Cinquecento to Seicento, from uh, Renaissance to Baroque. Werfling uh, has a Kantian approach. Werfling uh, was trained in philosophy. He was um, a pupil of Wilhelm Diltai. Also, Riegel was a pupil of a philosopher of Robert Zimmermann in, uh, in Vienna. And Wölfling studied with Diltai in Berlin. He knew very well Kant, and he proposes a sort of uh, variation of uh, uh, the Kantian uh, a priori. And as you can see from this quote, every artist finds certain pre-existing optical possibilities, conditions of possibilities of uh, the uh, figuration of uh, the uh, Darstellung, of the presentation of, of the images. Not everything is possible at all times. Seeing as such has its own history. Das Sehen an sich hat seine Geschichte. And uncovering this optical strata has to be considered the most elementary task of art um, history. So, history of uh, seeing, of das Sehen, which is a very strong <clears throat> statement because here it seems that it's uh, the history of the eye. It's the history of perception uh, itself. So, let's <clears throat> make an example of what uh, Werfling understands by optical strata or optical schemes uh, or a uh, history of seeing. His idea is that um, similarly to what uh, Riegel had said about the movement and the transformation of the styles from ancient Egypt to late Roman, Similarly, we have a passage uh, from Renaissance to Baroque, from Cinquecento to Seicento, from uh, an image which is constructed in a linear and tactile way, inviting you to approach the image. And the more you approach the image, the more information you get from the image. And on the contrary, in the Baroque art, in Baroque visual culture, you have chromatisms, shadows, uh, what uh, Wölfling calls the painterly, which is something that you can appreciate only, as it were, with your eyes. You cannot transform your eyes into fingers in order to follow the contours, the silhouette, the perimeter of the objects. Uh, here you have two um, examples of two naked women, so to say, an Eva by Dura and a woman finishing or just starting her bath by Rembrandt. But uh, of course there are lines in Renaissance, there are lines in Baroque, there are shadows in Renaissance and there are shadows in Baroque. But what is important is the leading element. And the leading element in Renaissance is the line, and the leading element in Baroque is the interplay of shadows. So if you focus, for example, on some details, you can see that in Dura, you always know <coughs> where the leg ends and where the background starts and where the left and the right leg is respectively and in relationship to the background. On the contrary, in Rembrandt, things are much more confused as it were. And uh, we are never sure, we can never be sure where to put the limit hmm, to establish the, the, the border between one element and the other. And again, it is a question also of uh, evolution in terms 
of uh, chronological and historical evolution of styles, which is an artistic evolution, but at the same time also an aesthesiological evolution. Wölflin is not naive, so he knows that um, there's not a, an absolute linear on the one side, Renaissance, and an absolute painterly on the other side. But we should think of these concepts more as gradients, which must be defined, defined uh, through a comparative approach. For example, if we take two artists, Botticelli and Lorenzo di Credi, both operating in Florence, more or less at the same time, and we, if we compare the way in which they represent the body of a woman, we would put them, uh, contrasting them, because we immediately notice their differences. But if we introduce a naked woman uh, at the representation of a, a female body uh, from the Nordic, Germanic Renaissance, for example, in Dürer, then the differences between Botticelli and Lorenzo di Credi diminish. They are reduced. And so to say, Botticelli and Lorenzo di Credi uh, build up a family of, of Florentine painters as opposed to the uh, Northern Renaissance artists like Dürer. But if we introduce a further element, uh, which is the woman painted by Rembrandt, then Dürer builds up a family together with Lorenzo di Credi and Botticelli, because they all the three of them belong to the linear Renaissance. So how to distinguish if a painting, if an image is linear or is painterly, also depends on the context of possible comparison. Again, uh, another quote showing that Wölflin is very much interested in this idea of the history of style as connected to a developmental history of seeing, Entwicklungsgeschichte des abendländischen Sehens of the Western world. But as you can see in the further development of this of this passage of this text, it speaks of an optical development, but also of what the English translation renders as representational possibilities. <clears throat> Darstellerischen Möglichkeiten. So Darstellung. Darstellung is actually the act of presenting something in in an image, of of um, visualizing something in an image, which is quite different from seeing something. And here you have um, a further re-elaboration of this thought in the revision that Berfin wrote in 1933 so uh, almost 20 years after the first edition of his Principles of Art History, uh, trying to, to respond to his uh, critics. I don't know whether people have always seen things the same way. I think it's unlikely, but it is safe to say that one can observe different types of imagination for Stellungsarten in successive stages of art. So a further ambiguity, another ambiguity, because the first ambiguity was between perception, actual seeing, and Darstellung, visualizing, presenting in an image, configuration. And now he introduces a third term, <coughs> which is Vorstellung, imagination, which is something which has to do with a mental activity rather than uh, the Darstellung, a concrete presentation uh, in an image. So, Wölflin speaks of a Geschichte des Sehens, of a history of uh, seeing 
correlated with a history of perception, but is far from being clear because it oscillates between perception, vision, and chown, zen, but also figuration, depiction, presentation in form, shapes, colors, darstellung. And finally, as we have seen in the last quotation, vorstellung, imagination, representation, way of seeing. Auge, he says, zen, but in inverted commas, as to suggest that we should take these terms metaphorically, way of seeing, more like a Weltanschauung than like an actual seeing. While, <clears throat> why did Riegel and Wölflin use the same categories, the same categorical couples, close, distant, linear, painterly, tactile, optical, because they, they were both reader of um, theorist and an artist, a sculptor, Adolf Hildebrand, who wrote in uh, 1893 this little book, very complicated, The Problem of Form in the Fine Arts, a uh, very complex uh, text, but also very, very uh, famous among the artists. Because uh, Hildebrand was trying to translate the optics developed by Hermann von Helmholtz uh, in a language uh, which could be understandable by, by artists. And uh, Helmholtz had studied the modification of the crystalline lens uh, and the accommodation of the crystalline lens, uh, if you look at an object uh, at close distance or uh, at a distance, actually, you know? because it's muscles in the eye which, which uh, allow you to focus uh, correctly the objects. And in this book, uh, Hildebrand uh, distinguishes between a fan build and an a build, a distant image and a near image, as two different modes of seeing. Riegel and Wölflin read Hildebrand and transform Hildebrand in uh, history, we could say. Because for Hildebrand, uh, seeing distant images or seeing near images is a possibility which is always open. In Riegel and Wölflin, these two modes become characteristic of a specific stylistic period. Near for Regal is Egypt, for Wölflin is Renaissance, distant for Regal is late Roman, for Wölflin is Baroque. Going back to Benjamin, Benjamin was surely conditioned by this approach. He was very evidently very interested in uh, the idea that styles had to do not only with um, artistic options, so to say, but also with uh, aesthesiological, perceptual options. But he was also critical of the so-called Stilgeschichte, of the history of styles developed on the one side by Riegel and the Vienna School, on the other side by, by Wölflin. What was the main point of criticism? The fact that... Uh, um, these theories in the Kunstwissenschaft, in the science of art, were limited to a formal signature, as he calls it. They were formalists. And so they were not interested, as he, on the contrary, was, uh, as he says here, in the social upheavals and in the material conditions and conditioning, the economic conditioning of the transformation of perception and styles of art in, in time. So I think that um, he draw also on different sources to integrate the formalist approach of Rieger and Wölflin with other more concrete, so to say, approaches. One is Marx. 
Benjamin was not a great reader of Marx because he knew Marx secondhand, so to say, especially through Lukács and other Marxists. But he did know uh, the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. And uh, you can find many quotations of these manuscripts uh, in the Passagenwerk. And here Marx says, the, speaks of the five senses not only as immediate or direct organs, unmittelbare organe, but also as social organs, gesellschaftliche organe. So these senses are to be conceived as historically conditioned. The Bildung der fünf Sinne ist eine Arbeit der ganzen bisherigen Weltgeschichte. The forming of the five senses is a labor, eine Arbeit, a work of the entire history of the world down to the present. So Marx, again, he suggests this possibility of, uh, of the historicity of the senses. It does not develop it, but this is a very strong statement. And the second <clears throat> source is Georg Zimmel. In, in, in his opus uh, Magnum, uh, The Philosophy of Money, published in 1900, but also in the very famous essay on the metropolis and mental life, or in the article on the sociology of the senses, uh, uh, which was further re-elaborated in the excursus uh, on the sociology of sense impression in the Grosse Sociologie, 1908. All texts in which Zimmel develops uh, um, theory of the evolution of the human sensorium, we could say. The aesthesis becomes urban in uh, Zimmel, and he describes how, for example, uh, we uh, in 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 an urban uh, setting, and he was observing the transformation of Berlin into uh, a metropolitan city at the beginning of the 20th century. So he had a, a privileged point of observation. The effectiveness of the senses at a distance becomes weaker with the heightening of culture, their effectiveness stronger within close range, and we become not only near-sighted but altogether near sense, sensed. And Zimmel, as you know, was very much interested in the transformation of the human sensorium and of human sensibility due to the introduction of um, transportation, modern transportation, trains, trams. And if you give a look at um, Walter Rudman's movie, Berlin, die Symphonie der Großstadt, you can have an idea, although it's a bit later because Zimmel died in 1918. The movie came out in 1927, but nevertheless, it gives you the idea of uh, the traffic and the traffic uh, and, and the introduction of uh, media and devices of uh, public transportation was one of the major factors, according to Zimmel, in the transformation of the of the human uh, of the human sensorium. Zimmel speaks of of this uh, <clears throat> powerful development of of the of the near senses. And famously, Benjamin describes uh, photography in terms of a tactile experience, no? because it, it becomes the image becomes man, manipulable at hand. The desire of the present day masses to get closer to things. Give a look at these uh, women of the Victorian age who are plunging in their stereoscopes. They want to, to immerse themselves uh, in, into the image you know, because they are not happy with a uh, contemplation at a distance with the image, but they want to, to, to achieve uh, a complete immersion in the image or to appropriate the image uh, through manipulation. No? And I think that this is uh, quite a prophetic uh, analysis, diagnosis uh, by Benjamin, because in the 30s, uh, 
he had already understood the transformation in terms of the digital. Digital in terms, uh, in the etymological sense of the digitus, Latin for finger, no? the image becomes manipulable in, in the touch screen. And of course, uh, th this is my recent uh, strand of research, as Matteo recalled uh, in, his, in his friendly introduction at the beginning, uh, virtual reality as a further development of this becoming near of the uh, image. And you see the, the, the proxemic, the, the, the posture of the bodies of the Victorian girls with their stereoscopes and these contemporary girls with their virtual reality headsets are, are, very, are very similar. So the idea is from tactile to optical in Regal, from tactile to optical in Wölflin, respectively from Egyptian to late Roman, Regal, from Renaissance to Baroque, Wölflin. Benjamin takes the two categories, but inverts the movement because bourgeois art was a far image, optical contemplation, oratic, aura, the aura is far. It's the experience of a distance, regardless of how close you are to the painting, to the picture. On the contrary, with the with photography and with cinema, the image comes closer to us. It's the experience of the shock. It's the experience of the image approaching more and more the, the beholder. So far, Benjamin and his depths towards uh, Kunstwissenschaft, Riegel Wölflin, in a mediated way, Hildebrand, but also with uh, Marx, with Zimmel. But uh, a strong criticism against this way of understanding the relationship between styles of art and styles of perception, a strong criticism had already been pronounced by Panofsky. The young Panofsky writes in 1915 a very severe criticism in a review of Wölflin, Wölflin's uh, book uh, Kunstgeschichtliche Grundbegriffe, the, the Principles of Art History. And Panofsky says that Wölflin takes, so to say, literally, when one says that an art that interprets what is seen in the sense of the linear or of the painterly sees in a linear or painterly way. But this concept uh, is no longer optical, but rather psychic. Wölflin uh, makes a mistake because he assigns to the artistic productive scene the place that befits the natural receptive scene a place that lies underneath the expressive faculty. Here, Panofsky is very Kantian or neo-Kantian. Hmm? Mensch, they are Mensch. The human being in general remains the same, hmm? at least uh, on the historical scale. Hmm? The evolution has different times, different temporality. But as far as history and art history is concerned, the mensch is always a stable being and perception does not change. What changes is culture. What changes are the artists. What changes is expression. What changes is Darstellung, is the modes are the modes of visualization. Mm 
So we couldn't imagine, I think, a more different way of reading uh, this relationship between uh, styles of art and styles of perception than the opposition represented by the couple Benjamin and Panofsky. For Benjamin, there is a correlation, there is a connection, although it is not very clear how we should understand it, because he puts forward the hypothesis, but he does not develop it. For Panofsky, on the contrary, we should keep the two worlds, the two domains, totally separated. The natural human being in his perceptual operations remains the same. We see the world as an Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian man or woman saw the world, or a late Roman woman or man saw the world, or a Renaissance man or a Baroque man. There's no difference. What is different are the cultural and expressive options of the Darstellung, of the presentation. There are further uh, chapters in this uh, history, quite interesting, which in a way uh, expand on this opposition. Theorists who incline to accept the possibility of uh, a correlation and uh, theories who radically reject the possibility of this correlation. For example, Michael Baxendal in his very famous uh, 1972 volume, Painting and Experience in 15th century Italy, develops in chapter two this idea of the, of the period I. Mm -hmm. The period I is the I looking at the world, but conditioned according to a specific period to uh, conditioned by a uh, human equipment he says a stock of patterns categories habits of inference and analogy knowledge and skills of interpretation the very same figure for example this circle with rectangles uh, black on white can be read, can be interpreted by different people in different ways of perceiving according to the context, depending on the context and depending on the skills, depending on the cognitive styles, depending on the competencies. For example, if we show this figure to Leonardo, trained to understand some um, conventions in architectural representation in uh, the Italian Renaissance, he would understand it as a circular building with a cupola, perhaps. The circle is a cupola and the rectangular uh, forms and shapes here are the holes of a building. But if you show this figure to a 15th century Chinese, once he had learned the ground plan convention, he might infer a circular central court on the lines of the new temple of heaven at Peking. So, what is uh, the same shape appears totally differently uh, in a, total, a totally different way to different eyes according to their education, to their skills, to their cognitive competencies. So what they know influences and conditions what they see. And what they see is the same figure, but the same figure appears in a totally different, in a totally different uh, meaning. It is very interesting that with this idea of cognitive style, Baxandal could be uh, interpreted as a pioneer of visual, visual culture studies. And actually, he employs the term visual culture in a passage of, uh, of, uh, of this book. <laughs> 
And on this uh, <clears throat> line, we could further go on with, for example, Svetlana Alpers in her famous book on uh, describing uh, when she distinguishes between two totally different approaches uh, of visual culture, of seeing, but at the same time representing narration as typical of uh, Italian painting, historia, like in Alberti, as opposed to description in Dutch painting. Or even more clearly in uh, the notion of scopic regime, the regime scopic uh, developed by, by Martin J., uh, who drew on uh, Christian Metz, Le Signifiant Imaginaire, in order to develop uh, a theory of different scopic regimes, uh, which were typical of different phases in uh, the history of seeing, which is a cultural history of seeing. A scopic regime, several perhaps competing scoping regimes, he calls them visual subculture, multiple implications of sight, and famously distinguishes between uh, Cartesian perspectivalism, which is a sort of combination between the Renaissance notion of linear perspective and Cartesian ideas of uh, subjective uh, rationality, Baconian empiricist descriptivism, which is very close to what uh, Svetlana Alpers called the style of description in, in painting, typical of Northern art or Dutch art, Suppresses, suppressing narrative and textual reference in favor of description and visual surface, and number three, Baroque, desire, like in this Bernini's Santa Teresa, in its erotic as well as metaphysical forms, courses through the Baroque scopic regime. We are not interested here in uh, justifying or rejecting the categories and the types proposed by Martin J., but rather to reflect upon the very notion of scopic regime, because it's, it's a notion of scopic regime which he says is no more natural or closer to a true vision, implying that there is no true vision, but that vision, so perception, is always inflected in a cultural way. There is no natural vision on the one side, and then you have the different scopic regimes uh, which inflect the true vision on the other side. It's a plurality, he says, of scopic regimes, and he speaks of even of a fiction of a true vision. So the idea that we can speak of vision in the singular is completely rejected by, by Martin Jay. I think that the most radical um, um, version of this idea was put forward by philosopher Marx Vartovsky in a series of articles in the 80s. Art History and Perception, 1980. Bartowski states, the argument I will make is that visual perception has a history and that historical changes in visual perception are in fundamental ways the result of changes in the forms of pictorial representation in art. So he reverses the idea that was Panofsky's idea the mensch remains the same and the mensch adopts different uh, ways of representation in different times in art history. It's vice versa. The different ways of representation in time condition and modify visual perception. Human vision is a cultural artifact created and transformed by the historical practice of representation in art. We constitute our ways of seeing and change them by means of the ways in which we picture what we see. 
History of art is a crucial component of the history of perception. And again, in another article, no, he, he is strongly externalist. We would, we could call him nowadays. No, no internal representation without external representation. Ways of representing become ways of seeing. They introduce transformation of vision. This uh, thesis put forward by Bartowski became the, ob the object uh, <clears throat> of um, intense discussions. Um, for example, Noel Carroll, the analytic philosopher, uh, in this symposium, symposium uh, hosted by the Journal of Aesthetic and Art Criticism in 2001, The Historicity of the Eye, admits somehow the possibility of accepting at least uh, um, a part of uh, Vartovsky's argument. Carol says, it's the sort of thing that happens when after attending to paintings by Cezanne and remarking upon the busyness of the contours around uh, the objects, I come to notice in every day life that the longer I look at the edges of things, the more they appear to vacillate. So I notice in Cezanne that Cezanne never um, specifies in a clear way the edges and the contours on the objects. Why? Perhaps because if I go back to my natural perception, as it were, I realize that actually it is very difficult in an ordinary perception to establish the clarity of the edges of the contours. So Cezanne, so to say, uh, um, instructs me to learn something about my ordinary perception. And he even goes further. I can learn about features of how the world looks that I heretofore neglected. This can change me indelibly. Perhaps I will never see fruit in exactly the same way after studying certain still lies by Cezanne. Perhaps this will even modify my own neuroperceptual system. Perhaps whole subcultures could be taught to notice what Cezanne noticed. On the other hand, we have Arthur Danto as a very radical critic and opponent of the idea of the historicity of the eye as correlated to the historicity of perception. He says in the same symposium, the Chinese world would look just like Chinese pictures of the world. It's a charming, but essentially crazy thought. It's a crazy thought. And, and uh, Danto insists on the fact that the, the eye is not historical, but we are. The philosophy of art begins here. So again, it seems to, even if he does not quote Panofsky as a critic of Wolflin, he seems to repropose this dualism, this antinomy between, on, on the one side, nature, the mensch, the human being in general, as a stable perceptual subject, and on the other side, this very same mensch, when it comes to culture, when it comes to art, when it comes to artistic expression, then uh, we have historicity. We have historicity of art. We have historicity of art. For example, <laughs> in looking at the bird, at the hawk. We see the hawk in the first picture, top left, uh, with our own eyes. Let's imagine that's a hawk that we are now observing in the sky. And then we recognize the hawk in a drawing, 
but then we can appreciate how the oak is inflected historically, depending whether it's it's an illuminated manuscript of uh, emperor uh, how do you say Federico II in English? Uh, Fred, Frederick the Zweite, or in in an Egyptian uh, in an Egyptian uh, representation. So these are two very different ways of considering perception on the one side and representation darstellung on uh, on the other side so again it seems it seems here that um danto uh, reproposes and and puts forward forward once more the idea that we should keep these two domains uh, uh, strictly separated in conclusion, I would, uh, so to say, play Panofsky against the Panofsky himself, because it is true that this red statement that you can read here is valid for Danto, is valid for Panofsky as um, in his criticism of Wölflin, but it is also true that uh, if we look closer, um, we can find um, a slightly different approach which might be interesting to conclude upon. What does it mean to see something? It is not um, a simple fact of perception as Panofsky himself recognizes in this very interesting essay on describing and interpreting works of the visual arts. For example, commenting on Grunewald and uh, his very famous Isenheim Alter, and in particular on, on uh, uh, the figure of Jesus ascending and uh, resurrecting. We could describe this figure of Jesus as hovering in the void as if this Jesus is located in empty space without a ground line on which to stand. But how can we say hovering in, in the void? How can we say that this Jesus is kind of flying in the void over the soldiers? Because if we compare this hovering, this kind of flying in an empty space, with another representation, for example, in uh, the Gospels of Otto, this nativity, the manger with the Christ child, the ox and ass, Mary, they are all positioned in empty space without any hint of a standing line. But yet, in this case, these objects are not meant to hover. Why? Because the dark background does not represent the sky, but is an abstract foil. So we should not mistake these two apparently hovering figures in a representation of the 16th century, like in Grunewald, and in a representation of the 10th century, like in the Gospels of Otto, as being the same representation that I am seeing in the picture. Because this hovering depends on the conventions in style and in representation, depending on different times, different contexts. So what I am seeing can be described also all, only in terms of a terminology which is uh, culture dependent. Just to get to a conclusion, um, history of perception, question mark. Of course, if we understand perception only and exclusively in terms of 
vision in the neurophysiological sense or in the mechanical sense on in the theory of wave sense and we say that when we see nothing else happens then neurophysiological mechanisms or a theory of light mechanism of retina mechanism of course in this sense we should reject the idea that there is a history of perception but if we accept the idea that every time that we open our eyes either on the real world or on a picture like in the case of grunewald or uh, the gospels of otto every time that we open our eyes something else happens not just a neurophysiological mechanism operating in our vision but also a gaze i think that here gaze is the key term because gaze is is vision but is also visibility but is also a regime of visibility and on of invisibility it is also vision at the same time inflected by cult cultural conditioning so i of course i'm not denying that there is a neurophysiological basis of vision but saying that vision is just this i think that cuts away cuts off uh too many things in terms of uh, on, of gaze in terms of cultural conditioning which are always there and always operating according to our being situated in a context to our being uh, historically situated and i will stop here uh, and thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your comments <laughs>